What's cracking, YouTube? Welcome back to the channel. You know who it is. It's your boy, Nicholas Nikolai. Big dogs got to eat fantasy football, getting ready for 2018 fantasy football season. Ooh, we dusty in this motherfucker. Low kisses to all y'all suckers. We're looking at sleepers today. You know, obviously there's no such thing as a sleeper nowadays. You'll hear every every single player's name by the time your draft comes in August or September or whatever. We're talking about undervalued players. Guys whose ADP at the time of this video, which is like end of March, you could take advantage of, right? If you want to join a best ball league, download the draft app, use promo code BDGE, you'll get a free entry into some kind of money league. And these are the ADPs from those leagues right now. If you watch this in like July or August, most of the information will still be relevant, but the ADPs are going to be outdated. Stick with me and keep that in mind. I originally made this blog post as 10 guys, but I'm going to break it into two parts because I think it might take too long. So we're going to go five guys today and then maybe five guys next week or something like that. We're doing only running backs, wide receivers for now. We'll make quarterback and tight end their own video. So if y'all pumped up, like I'm, I'm a, I'm pumped. Uh, uh, y'all pumped up, go, go down there, hit the thumbs up on this video. Also, if you're interested in blogging for me this summer and into the season, shoot me an email, nick at bigdogsfantasy.com. I'm looking to bring on a couple bloggers for my website. Um, I eventually want someone to take over the waiver wire sheet on a weekly basis throughout the season and maybe a few other slots. So if you're looking to get your foot in the industry or the door, Hit me up, shoot me an email, that'll be linked below. Otherwise, let's get this muh cracking. Yo, yo. Also, do yourselves a favor, go follow me on Instagram, go follow me on Twitter. I give away plenty of value through both of those platforms uh, that you're not going to find in these videos and stuff. So I will put that probably down here. We're going to start off with, uh, you know, the earlier ADP guys. So guys going kind of early and then we'll make our way down to like some late, later round sleepers. The first guy up I'm talking about is Joey Joseph Mixon. I wonder if he's one of those people that gets mad, like if you call him Joey. Hey, Joey Mix. Joey Mix. Joey Mix. Okay. Joey Mixon, Cincinnati Bengals. He's getting picked around RB18, you know, mid-30s. The thing I love about this is he's getting picked basically where he was last year. And going into last year, we had no idea what the backfield situation was going to be. We had no idea, you know, how early he would start taking over the featured role there in the Bengals' backfield. Now we know exactly where he stands. God Zam it. Now we know exactly where he stands going into this season, still getting picked at the same spot. He's going to be their bell cow. According to Roto World, director of player personnel Duke Tubin told reporters at the Combine that the Bengals envisioned Joe Mixon as their bell cow back for 2018. Now listen, I'm not denying, you know, from this side of the screen, over here, that his rookie season was underwhelming to say the least, right? Three and a half yards of carry, only scored four times. But the Bengals gave him almost nothing to work with, right? Look at his offensive line. They were awful. They were, I think, the eighth worst or ninth worst graded run blocking line in 2017 per Football Outsiders. Uh, you know, as soon as they lost Andrew Whitworth, their all-world left tackle, things went to shit there in Cincinnati. Now, there are a lot of positives moving forward. Here's what you got to take away from Mixon's rookie year, right? He was really, 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 really good in the receiving game. 9.6 yards per reception he averaged, which is very high for a running back. He also caught 88% of the targets thrown his way. And that's not even counting in targets that were off target, you know, ones that were deemed not catchable. So catching almost every pass thrown his way with a high yards per reception total is going to equate in very big passing numbers as long as the volume is there. Jeremy Hill was in the mix last year, as was Geo. Jeremy Hill is not there anymore, signs with the Patriots. Look at Mixon's splits last year with and without Jeremy Hill. The numbers kind of speak for themselves. Targets, rushing yards, rushing touchdowns, those kind of things go up, whatever. Three and a half yards per carry was a low number. You don't want to see that for someone that you expect to put up big numbers, but on an efficiency standpoint, he still was good. Per player profiler, Mixon ranked 13th in the NFL in yards created per attempt, 1.54. So that's yards created outside of what the line blocked for you. So he ranked 13th in the NFL with that. And again, it's tough to it's tough to just pin a, a yards per carry number on a player, especially when they had the line like they did last year. Um, they didn't really give him a chance to get into the groove, right? He, his usage was pretty inconsistent. He had double-digit carries in just 8 of 14 games last year. Double-digit carries, so 10 carries in just 8 games. There were 6 games where Mixon didn't even carry the ball 10 times, which is ridiculous. 
But you look over the la- uh, over Mixon's last four games because he missed a few games last year. The last four games he played in, he averaged over five yards a carry. So towards the end of the season, when they started utilizing him and he started finding his way into the offense, the line started meshing a little better. That's when he started picking up his play. So five over five yards of carry the last four games he played in. Mixon was already the goal line back there. Now with Jeremy Hill out, he's the undisputed goal line back. Um, he was o- he was the only guy, the only running back in Cincinnati last year to have more than one carry inside the five yard line. So Geo had one goal line carry. Mixon had I think it was six. So you know those will all be his in 2018. There's no questions there. Addressing the offensive line is going to be the biggest part of whether or not Mixon can take that big jump forward to like an elite running back that we all expected him to be. Now, they did take a a good step in the right direction here by adding Cordy Glenn. Cordy Glenn uh, was a left tackle for the Bills. He has missed 17 games in the last two years. So injury history is his biggest concern, and that's probably why they got him for a cheap price. They swapped first-round picks. I think it was like the 13th for the 21st. And they also swapped like a fifth and sixth round pick or something like that. But um, Cordy Glenn's very, very, very good when he's healthy. Unfortunately, he hasn't been healthy. So that's going to be a a big point for him. Glenn's 28 years old. Uh, He's expected to be ready for OTAs after missing the end of last season. If he's going to be healthy, he's going to be a huge boost. Because like I said, losing Whitworth was huge to that line. That left tackle spot killed them. They ranked, uh, I was looking on, I think it was also uh, Football Outsiders, they show you a breakdown of success per like the, um, the the running lanes. So they look at like left tackle, left end, and for left end rushes where you know Whitworth would have been, and now Cordy Glenn will be. They were 29th in the NFL. So that's a huge upgrade for Mixon because he's a guy who could break the runs outside. You know, he's got that speed, he's got the agility. So this is going to be huge. If he's healthy, that's that's a big boost for Mixon. Um, you know, and one more thing to add. You know, a lot of people compared Mixon and his running style to Le'Veon Bell coming into the league. And, uh, you know, you might be like, oh, you know what, he, was, he wasn't good enough last year to even think of him as Bell. But remember Le'Veon Bell's rookie year, too. He averaged three and a half yards per carry. He did not play great. He had a high volume, which Mixon didn't get, but his efficiency was not good. So before you want to write him off and say he's inefficient or whatever, so was Le'Veon Bell. And Le'Veon Bell's offensive line ranked like 24th in run blocking his rookie year per football outsider. So it's kind of a similar situation. And, you know, if since he can kind of get this offseason right, if, if they make some good moves to bolster this O-line, then Mixon could see a huge jump forward. I think, you know, they're already saying he's the workhorse there, right? He is the guy. At pick 34 or 35, you're, you will never get someone with this much upside at that price. And his floor is great too. Like it, his floor is RB2 at worst. So, um, I, I just think it's, it's a no-brainer for mixing here. Numero dos, my man's Larry Fitz, Larry Fitzgerald, wide receiver in Arizona. Going around pick 52, which is basically where he was going last year as well, wide receiver 23. This is another easy one for me that y'all are just going to keep disrespecting the God out there. I can't get it through your heads for like the third summer in a row. 109 catches in 2017. 108 NFL league leading in 2016, 109 in 2015. Y'all seeing a trend here? It's really not that difficult. One of the most secure PPR plays in fantasy football over the last three years. Who call on my phone? How you going? It's fine. It's just ESPN. They want me bad. I told them, frick no, bro. You know where we at? I stay posted up in my room. They can come to me. Where were we? I was probably saying something ignorant. Yeah, I was. Okay, so... So, Fitz is coming back for his last year. He's 91 catches away from catching Tony Gonzalez for the second most receptions in NFL history. Something like 1,300. I don't know. It's a crazy number. I don't feel like figuring it out. But 91, that's where he wants to get to. And that should be no problem considering what he's done the last few years. Even at 91, you're a PPR steal, you know? Those are great numbers. And and I think, I don't really think there's a reason for people to shy away from Fitzgerald. Like, he, he gave you no reason last year or the year before to do so. You know, Carson Palmer's retired. But Palmer's also been kind of trash the last couple of years. Now they get Sam Bradford. They bring him in for two years. Before you want to shit on Sam Bradford, he is technically... He's the only person that you could be technically and arguably the most accurate passer in NFL history. Remember in 2016, he set the NFL record for a season completion percentage. I think that shit was like 71.6% he completed in 2016. 
Obviously, that came as a result of his average depth of throw being 6.6 yards, which was dead last in the NFL that year. So that's, that's why his percentage was so high. The good news for Larry Fitzgerald is, guess what? That's where he runs his routes. This is like the perfect, this is like the peanut butter and pickles. Yeah, I said pickles, man. I don't really fuck with jelly that much. I like pickles. Actually, PB&J with pickles is good. PB and banana probably trumps that. Yo, you know what's really good? Peanut butter and syrup sandwiches. Stay woke. This is the peanut butter and syrup combination that Larry Fitzgerald needed. You have a guy who's super accurate throwing the ball in short and intermediate length passes. Fitz don't run those deep passes. He's not the guy who's going to break you outside. You know what I mean? So um, this, I think it's a great, I think it's a great spot for Bradford to have landed. Now, obviously, the big component here for the Cardinals' offense is the fact that they're going to be getting. David Johnson back. Before I get into that, let me just make sure this camera's still on. Alright, if you're enjoying the video thus far, please make sure you give that thing a thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel if you're new as always. You know what it is. I always be breaking down the analysis like this. Ain't nothing new. Always bring the noise. This camera's gonna drop off and fall, I feel like, soon. Um, where were we? Where were we? Yeah, so David Johnson comes back. He's gonna eat up targets, of course. He's gonna be a huge piece of this offense. Now, I'm looking back at 2016, he had a 16.5% target share in the offense. Last year, Arizona running backs as a total had 16%. So just a little bit under David Johnson, 16.5%. Obviously, that doesn't take into account the complete percentage of target share from running backs, but it's not that much higher, right? It probably was like 18% overall and fits still eight, right? He still had 108 catches, led the NFL in reception. So David Johnson coming back, I think I look at it as more of a positive, right? He is going to take up more targets, but he's also going to be able to move the offense. And that's another thing I want to kind of hammer home. Fitz last year, right? I was looking at targets inside the opponent's 10-yard line. Fitz had seven targets inside the opponent's 10-yard line last year. So in the, we call that the 10 zone. Seven targets inside the 10-yard line last year. In 2016, he had 12 of them. 2015, he had 12 of them. So a dip last year. I think you could probably credit that to the fact that the offense just struggled as a whole, right? It was not a good offense. So uh, with David Johnson back, I think things run more smoothly here. I think pick up and, and they're going to score more this year, which in turn would lead to more targets for Fitz, more touchdowns in that area. Um, so, you know, I, I look at DJ coming back as a positive. The other thing I want to argue with people that are against Fitz, last year I heard this argument time and time and time again, and you know, Fitz was one of my biggest sleepers last year, last summer, that I was trying to argue people into drafting. People were like, oh, he always, you know, he's old, he's fucking old as shit. I know that. I'm not arguing against that. He's like 34, 35. He, he, like, I don't know how he's still even functioning. I could barely function. I'm 25. People were like, oh, he always fades away over the last half of the season. And, you know, you looked at the numbers, 2015, 2016, and he did perform poorly over, not poorly, but worse than he did over the first half. Now, we looked at 2017. That told a different story, my friends. You look at his fantasy numbers over the last eight games that the Cardinals played compared to their first eight, and you actually see an increase in fantasy points, in receptions, in targets, and receiving yards. So, He's old, but he ain't slowing down over the second half of last year. So get that out of your head if you're, you know, if that's a concern for you. <sighs> again, I'm all aboard the Fitz hype train. So sign me up once again. Fitz will be on a lot of my teams uh, as my fifth, fourth round pick, depending on where he ends up in draft. So, you know, Fitz is my, my dude, my guy. Next up, number three, we're going to shift over back to the running bikes. Bike to the running bikes. We got my boy Flexi, Flexi Burkhead, a.k.a. Rex Goathead, a.k.a. Sexy Rexy. How the fuck did Rex Ryan end up with the nickname Sexy Rexy? Or is it Rex Grossman? Either way, Rex Burkhead needs to be recognized as the GOAT. I hope this is not, like, fucking tilted. I'm tilted right now. So, Burkhead going around pick 90, running back 35. So, he gets a three-year, almost $10 million, uh, um... Contract on the Patriots. And I actually went in depth on this, I think, in my top free agency signing video, um, that the last video I put out. So if you watch that and, you know, you've heard enough about Sexy Rexy, which I don't think is is even possible, you could probably skip this part and head over to number four. But I'll touch on Rex for those who haven't seen the video. He gets five and a half million guaranteed from the Pats, which is a lot of money for them guaranteed to give to a running back. They don't usually do that. And I think a big reason that, that they did that was because, you know, they couldn't afford to sign Lewis 
Deion Lewis, who goes to Tennessee for a lot more money. They wanted Lewis back, of course, but I think Burkhead brings a lot of the same assets and skill set to the Patriots' backfield that Lewis did. So he's not the same inside runner as Lewis, but he's he could do a lot of, you know, he can play all three downs. He can run the ball, catch the ball, block, all that kind of stuff. So that's why I think, you know, they went for Burkhead instead of Lewis. I mean, you just look at Burkhead's numbers last year, right? He played in 10 games, had 520 total yards. 30 receptions, and 8 touchdowns. That's in 10 games. So you pace that out to 16 games, which, you know, if you're drafting a player, you, you, that's, what you, you, that's what you project them to do, right? Because if he doesn't play, you just throw someone else in there. It's not like you're getting zero points. So over a 16-game span, those numbers equate to 830 total yards, 48 catches, 12.8 touchdowns, so 13 touchdowns, making him RB13 last year in half-point PPR. It's probably higher in full-point PPR, but... RB13, half one PPR, right behind Jordan Howard. You know, he earned his way to the point where he made Mike Gillisley, pretty much James White, redundant by the end of the season. Um, Mike Gillisley and Jeremy Hill are going to be battling for a spot, but Burkhead also had the second most rushes inside the five yard line um, for the Patriots. He had seven of them. Gillisley was the only guy in the backfield that had more than him with eight. And a lot of those came, you know, in that first game where he scored three touchdowns and in the beginning of the season. So Burkhead was pretty much that guy over the last 75% of the season. So clearly they are, they are comfortable with him running the ball into the goal line or into the end zone, which they'll probably be doing a lot of this year. So that's, that's a big, that's a big move um, for Burkhead. You know, that's a, that's a big upgrade for him if he's going to get those touchdown opportunities and he doesn't fumble the ball. He did not lose a fumble last year, which is crucial if you want to stay in on third downs, if you if you want to play at all with, with Billy, with Uncle Billy Belichick over there. Oh, yeah. I'm not expecting, like, a crazy breakout. I don't expect him to finish as an RB1. I don't expect him to finish as the RB13, but um, I think he's just an absolute PPR steal at running back 35, you know, 95. I will. He's a perfect flex play um, if you can get him at that, at that pick. Who else we got? Another running back. We got the homie. The big homie, hey, Don, Deont, Deonta Foreman from Houston. He's going around pick 115, 120, running back 47. Now, this is all, not all, I think Foreman's a good running back, uh, but I I think a lot of this is it, is me thinking that well, no way Lamar Miller finishes this season as the, the Houston starter there, right? Foreman's ADP right now, like 120 a shot just because of recency bias, right? He, he he left last year, week 11, I think it was, with a torn Achilles, so he missed the end of last year. So people are kind of forgetting about him, but that ADP is going to jump up as soon as, you know, like camp buzz starts kind of floating around and whatnot. So let's talk about the backfield a little bit. 2017, Miller's, Lamar Miller's yards per carry dipped for the fourth consecutive season. He had a career low 3.7 yards per carry. He just looked sluggish running the balls, right? He was like the Marco Murray of, of the Houston Atlanta Vegas area. Um, he scored three rushing touchdowns, scored three receiving touchdowns. So, you know, as someone who gets the volume that Miller does, you would like to see him score more than three rushing touchdowns. And it was a it was a low number in 2016 as well. So I think that kind of speaks to Lamar Miller as a player and what Houston wants to do with him. Um, it was clear from a usage standpoint, but by the end of the year, he was not the featured back there anymore, right? Over the last three weeks of the regular season, Miller saw 27 carries to Alfred Blue's 46. Blue even out-targeted him in the receiving game 6-5. to five. And, you know, Lamar Miller in the receiving game was arguably like his, one of his strengths or the strength when it comes to uh, outperforming his competition in the backfield, his, his competitors, you know, that are competing for those snaps. So to see that is not a good thing. Uh, it kind of said that they didn't really trust him. That being said, Alfred Blue is an under, uh, unsigned free agent right now, so he's off the team, which now we entered Deonta Foreman, right? Torres Achilles, like I said, in week 11 of 2017. All reports basically say he should be ready for training camp. He should be ready to go. One thing to keep an eye on is definitely his conditioning. He entered last summer, I remember, a little out of shape, uh, which is probably why it took him a little while to get some touches during the regular season. But hopefully he can enter the year, the summer, in better shape. He needs to like chill with Mark season. Only I'm allowed to participate in Mark season. He ain't allowed to do that shit. So prior to the injury, Foreman was the B to Lamar Miller's A. He was averaging 4.2 yards per carry. Former Texas Longhorn, respect. 4.2 yards per carry to the Houston's starter, Lamar Miller's 3.7 yards per carry. One fewer rushing touchdown than Lamar Miller did, despite receiving 160 fewer carries and playing in almost half as many games as Lamar Miller. That should speak 
Well, that basically says all I need to say, but I'm gonna continue as I always do because I just like to talk. Um, I wonder if you guys get sick of like, am I, do I just like say random shit all day? Like, can you even sink in what I'm saying to you? I feel like I just throw out so many numbers and stats that if I was watching me, I would be like, I can't do this. Like this motherfucker's giving me anxiety just watching him and listening to him. Let me know. I would love to know if like I'm just out of control and you, I don't know. I guess the numbers say otherwise because a lot of you guys watch me for some reason. Anyways, Foreman's built like a tank. 2,000 yard rusher at Texas. He's like six foot, 230 pounds, runs a four five 40 yard dash. He has an adjusted weight adjusted speed score of 94th percentile. So he's a big dude that runs fast. He's built like Leonard Fournette, except that he's not as chiseled, right? He's got his body fat percentage would be a little bit higher than Fournette's, but if he was a little more shredded, people would be looking at him the same way. Real big, real fast. Uh, he was averaging double-digit touches for the Texans over his last eight games, and I expect him to compete for, if not steal outright the starting job for Houston in the summer. You know, Miller has proven inefficient with a big workload. They don't use him near the goal line, which is evidenced by his four rushing attempts inside the five-yard line, uh, four goal line attempts last year. You know, they have talent behind him in Foreman that can replicate and probably build on any efficiency that Lamar Miller had. So, had Foreman not gotten hurt, I think the backfield would have been a concrete 50-50 split, if not favored in Foreman's direction by the end of the year. So, Foreman's a guy with heavy, 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 heavy upside, a little bit of pun intended there, that you could probably get later in your draft. It is going to fucking shoot up probably by the end of the year or by the summer. But Foreman's a guy I would love to have on my team because I think the upside is like top seven, top eight running back. You have an RB1 if he takes over the starting job. Um, What else we got? I got three guys left on my list. Who should I pick? Who should I pick? We did a bunch of running backs. So why don't we go with a wide receiver? Why don't we go with my mans? All right, 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 Denver, why don't we move to the Mile High City and talk about Emmanuel Sanders. Right now, going around pick 100, wide receiver 43. People out here just forgetting about my man, Sandy. The Sandy Man. Does he have a nickname? The Sandman? Is that his nickname? No, definitely not. I just made that shit up. It's a terrible nickname. I'm embarrassed for saying that. I'm probably going to edit that shit out. He had a horrible year last year. I'm willing to, to chalk that up to being injury-related. I'm willing to chalk it up to being quarterback related. He had a bum ankle for the large majority of the season. Couple that with the play of Osweiler, Simeon, Paxton Lynch. It's not a good, it's not a good thing. It ain't a good thing there. Here's why, here's why I know that that injury was a big cause of why he, you know, didn't play as well and put up enough numbers there. We look back at 2016 when he played in, well, Technically, he played in 16 games, but like one of the games he played in like one snap and then left. So we're going to say 15 games. Played in 15 games. In 13 of those 15 games, he played in 80% of snaps or more. So he was a, almost an every snap player in, in almost every game. Last year, he played in 12 games because he missed four games due to the injuries. He only played in 80% of the snaps or more in five of those 12 games, right? So... He's not playing as a full-time starter for most of those games. And, you know, it's easy to be like, normally in this situation, you look at him and be like, he's 31 years old, he's getting older and whatnot, and someone's taking over his spot. The thing is, they have literally no one in the depth chart behind Sanders and Demarius Thomas. So for him to not be playing in that, in like a large snap share, could only speak to him being injured and then them not wanting him to run on the injury. So an ankle is something that's very flimsy and, you know, will cause irritation and linger for a while. So... The fact that his snap share went down so much from one year to the next without adding any competition to the depth chart means that it was definitely injury related. Talking about the quarterback play, that was, you know, it was obvious that they were awful. I'm looking at player profiler. Of Sanders' 92 targets last year, only 75% of them were even deemed catchable. So that takes out a quarter of your targets. So that takes out a, a big chunk of production that could have happened, but they were non catchable targets. Chalk that up to bad quarterback play. We also look at his average depth of target over the last few years, right? It's hovering about 13, hits almost 15 in 2015, 13 again in 2016, and then dips to about 11 and a half in 2017, last year. Sanders is a deep threat on that team, right? He's the guy who makes those plays down the field, but you put together a bad ankle with bad quarterback plays who, who are not accurate down the field, that's going to kill a lot of his upside. 
Um, and, and now we have Case Keenum obviously signing in Denver, which if nothing else, he's an upgrade. You know, if you want to say he's fluky or he's a one hit wonder, that's fine. But if nothing else, he's definitely an upgrade at the quarterback position to Paxton Lynch and, and those guys that played last year. So if nothing else, he is an upgrade to, to that, to what they had last year. And, you know, Case Keenum, we saw him do very well with Thielen and Diggs. And, you know, those are almost very, they're a younger version basically of Demarius Thomas and, uh, and, and uh, Emmanuel Sanders. So think of Thielen as DT, as more of a possession guy. Think of Stefan Diggs as the explosive playmaker who can make plays down the field, just like Emmanuel Sanders will be. So I think Emmanuel Sanders can put up some Stefan Diggs types games with Case Keenum there. Um, and I'm excited to kind of see him get back because he's going to be so undervalued this year. He, he, he showed so much consistency throughout the last few years of his career that for this one year with bad quarterbacks and a bum ankle, like, uh, you know, I don't know. I, I like Sanders this year a lot. Um, and I would a million times over, 100 million times over, take Sanders at his ADP of like 110 or 100, whatever it is, than Demarius Thomas, where he's going to go at like ADP 50 or 55. So uh, I'm definitely not opposed to taking either of those guys, but, I, you know, why not wait for Sanders? I think he has just as much upside, if not more, than DT. So that's going to wrap up this video. I hope that was hard hitting. I hope I even hit, did I do five guys? I think I did five guys. Anyways, the part two of this video is going to include another five guys. I'll probably drop that next week. I'll drop a couple names just to get into you. We got Alex Collins. Actually, I'm not going to drop all the names. I'm, I'm going to let you marinate and you, take a guess below who you think are going to be my other five guys for sleepers. So that's it. Uh, subscribe to the channel if you're new. Give it a thumbs up if you enjoyed the video. I'm working on an ultimate draft package that I want to offer to you guys as a product this year. I'm super excited. Draft guy, a bunch of shit I'm working on. So it's going to be good. Go follow me on my socials, all that kind of stuff. And I will see y'all in the next video. Oh.